But our next presenter, Grant Davidson, is the Managing Director of Davidson Branding. Grant has been working in the brand and advertising industry for the past 20 years. Over that time, he's worked with more than 200 Australian and international organisations, including 16 of the world's top 100 brands, nine of Australia's top, retail, uh, top 50 retailers, and 20 of the ASX top 50 corporations. If you've heard of a major company in Australia, this man has had something to do with the branding and the look that they are today. He's been uh, President and Vice President of the Design and Advertising Industry Bodies. He's sat on government boards. He's been published in industry journals and he's the proud recipient of close to 100 industry awards. He's a self-confessed knowledge junkie and he's, having, he's completed studies in psychology, consumer behaviours, change management and most recently sustainable competitive advantage at the Harvard Business School. Honestly, Grant, I don't know how you found time to do uh, such the great things you, that uh, you've done with your brandy, but ladies and gentlemen, please make him welcome, Grant Davidson. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. Um, uh, thank you, Judy and uh, Chris, for inviting me to speak at this uh, fantastic event. Um, and most importantly, thank you all for uh, coming along to listen. Uh, especially dragging yourself away from some of those exhibitions. I know um, the one where you throw the sheep into the spinning hole is incredibly addictive and I was stuck there for a while, so thanks for um, dragging yourselves away to come along. Um, now, before I start, oh, you probably gathered from the slide there that what I'll be talking about are strategies to survive and thrive in um, these here tough times. So before I hop into that, I would like to share something with you. Uh, this year, we've, um, well, my business has celebrated its 20-year anniversary, and I know what you're thinking, how can a guy in his 20s have run a business for 20 years, but um, that is true, so what I'd like to do is just share with you the little video that we created um, to celebrate that, which might just give you a little bit of background in terms of the type of work that uh, we've done. Let's hope it works. Over 20 years, we've worked with leading brands to create a difference. We're proud to have developed brands that have stopped the nation, started a movement, made people smile. get off the ground. And reach new heights. Help the fight against cancer. Revitalised Australian icons. of international standing. Helped spark a desire. And ignite a passion. And be rewarded with global recognition. We've helped Australians celebrate. that have touched millions of Australians through their letterboxes, fridges and their daily lives. stories, millions of Australians, decades of difference. Okay, so we've all heard about the doom and gloom, you know, we've read about it, we've uh, seen the movie, got the t-shirt. Um, what, uh, 
what we don't hear about, I guess well, we've heard about lots of businesses that have struggled, lots of businesses that have even sadly gone under, but what we haven't heard a lot about are the many, many businesses that have actually, what I call, spectacularly survived in this really tough economy. You know, businesses like IKEA that have grown by 8%, McDonald's 11%, um, even smaller Australian businesses like Smiggle, double-digit growth, 20%, Super Cheat Auto, 46%, even a local um, financial services business at 67 and uh, 95% growth. So in this same economy where everyone's suffering, uh, there are businesses that are experiencing growth and what I would describe as obscene profits, um, IKEA with three billion, McDonald's with five billion, and uh, uh, Apple there with a whopping $25 billion profit. So be very careful of what you read and hear in the press. It paints the wrong picture. There are businesses that are thriving and um, surviving in this economy, and it is definitely possible. So what I'm going to do is um, kind of share with you some of the principles that have made these successful businesses successful businesses in these times. Um, and one of the first principles, and uh, kind of a surprising principle in some respects, is that these guys are successful not specifically due to a spectacularly good product. Um, if you take IKEA, I mean, it's sort of cheap, it doesn't last very long, it's really hard to put together, so I, I think they're single-handedly responsible for that increased divorce rate if you've ever tried to put one together with your spouse. Um, and McDonald's, who we've named McChuckers, I mean, they're far from the best at providing a, a product, yet they're one of the world's most successful businesses. And dare I say it, my, my beloved um, Apple or the iPhone, in the first 12 months they had to do 2,500 upgrades because of uh, complaints from consumers. But despite this, this was the reaction that um, occurred with the launch of the iPhone. And what I find quite amazing here is this guy's not purchased the first phone. I mean, I think the guy who bought the first television set wasn't this excited. Um, and this is not the result of a fantastic product experience. I mean, this guy, um, who I call Joe, don't know if that's his name, but it's better than this guy. Um, Joe, when he decided to line up outside the Apple store three days prior, he hadn't tried the product, he hadn't tested it, he hadn't shopped around, he hadn't seen if it worked. He had committed to buying that product and quite happily and excitedly agreed or, or, or paid a phenomenal premium without actually experiencing that product. And this is effective and, and very clever marketing and advertising. Um, and not just my opinion, but uh, in The Economist uh, last year, there was this article along the lines of, um, the brand is the most important and sustainable asset of any organisation in the 21st century. Branding will be the only unique differentiator between companies. So I suppose the good news for a lot of businesses is you don't have to have the best product in your industry or, in, or that place in the world, but what you do have to be is exceptionally good at marketing and communication. So what I'll do is I'll just run through some of the components to help build better um, and more powerful brands. So there's two fundamental components. The first one is uh, an emotional value proposition. And the second one, if I can get that to work, is effective communication. So let me run through the emotional value proposition first. I guess what um, these successful brands know is uh, quite an important statistic that 80% of our purchasing decisions are driven by our emotions. Not logic, not rational attributes and thoughts about our emotions drive these purchasing decisions. So what these successful brands do is they, they build and market their businesses and brands based on emotion. What they do is they look to fulfill an emotional need. So if you take Coke, I mean, fundamentally, Coke is a, a bitter, carbonated, black um, soft drink. That's not very compelling if that's what was the headline for their ad. Um, but what they do is they don't sell that. What they sell is this um, need to feel young, to live life, and that's what they base their whole um, strategy on. And interestingly enough, most consumers in blind taste tests prefer the taste of Pepsi, their major competitor, yet Coke still outsells Pepsi two to one. So that's the power of um, selling on an emotional proposition. Um, again, very quickly, Volvo is a Swedish car, very much like Saab, very much like um, Skoda, I think it's the other one. Uh, but what they do is they don't sell those functional attributes. What they sell is one of the most fundamental emotional needs, which is to protect our, our family and our loved ones and they have since about 1960. And um, I probably should have put uh, Bogues in here, but uh, VB um, also proves that even blue-collar blokes actually have emotional needs that need to be fulfilled. Uh, and it's a beer much like many other beers, but fundamentally what they do is they sell this reward, this need to um, reward ourselves for a hard day's work. And interesting enough, uh, recently one in five beers sold in, in Australia were, uh, were VB, so I guess they reap the benefits of that. 
Um, the other principle of the emotional value proposition is around this thought, which is if you try to be all things to all people, you'll be nothing to nobody. And I guess this is one of the biggest traps that we see a lot of businesses falling into. Um, you tend to, when times get tough, want to do more things to more people, more product, more services. Um, and it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it's often the complete opposite that's true. I'll give you a very quick, um, quick story. I like stories and, and examples to illustrate the point. Uh, a friend's father, Bob we'll call him, um, ran a uh, stationary business for about 20, 30 years, most of his life, and he worked ridiculous hours and he worked hard. Anyway, as times got tough, what Bob started to do was more things. So he started um, selling videos or renting videos, and that still didn't work. And then he started um, doing dry cleaning, and then that still didn't work. And then he did, uh, he bought his coffee machine, started trying to sell coffee. Now, the more things he tried to do to get broader appeal to more, more audiences uh, actually had the rever almost reverse effect. It just, no matter how hard he tried, it just wasn't, um, wasn't working. Then in stark contrast, in about 2003, a company called, um, a business called Smiggle. Is everyone familiar with Smiggle? Yeah, most people with kids, I think, would be. Smiggle enters the market in about 2003, and they focus on one very, very um, thin slice of the market, teenage girls, um, with one very narrow product offering, which is very colourful, bright um, stationery. And what was incredible here is after only four years from startup, after four years, they sold their business for $30 million to the Just Group. So poor old, um, poor old Bob, who spent his whole life working incredibly hard, and after 30 years, I, I think his business would be, uh, you take me if I said this, but his business would be lucky if it was worth you know, a couple of hundred thousand. So the difference of actually being incredibly focused um, can make a massive difference. And again, it is counterintuitive, but you know, the, there's so many stats to support it. So the main um, benefit of the emotional value proposition is to give you absolute focus and clarity around everything that you do. Now, I've actually written everything in all capitals and have underlined it. So that's how important it is that everything you do is driven by this um, emotional value proposition. Uh, and again, Apple I'll use because <laughs> it's not an accident. These guys are fantastic. They just do everything exceptionally well. Um, Apple have their value proposition about thinking different, about challenging the, the, the norms, the status quo. Um, their philosophy talks about creating a, a movement that changes the world. I mean, nothing about gigabytes and the number of units per house, and which um, IBM would have done incredibly emotive and aspirational. Now, this drives every single thing that they've done within their organisation. From their, their logo, I don't know if anyone's read the rationale for this, but it's about taking a bite out of the forbidden fruit, which is about, again, challenging the norms and the status quo. Um, through their product, they never launch anything to market unless it's a game changer, unless it ch totally challenges the way we think about things. Um, through their online environment, uh, the way they promote and um, they always look for different ways and innovative ways to promote um, and create some excitement around launches of products. Uh, through their, oh, that's online as well, through their online experience. Um, even their stores, if anyone's been to, um, obviously there's a few in Australia now, but overseas there's some incredible stores. And if you look at the one down, well, maybe hard to see down the bottom left in LA, it is almost identical to um, my laptop here. So they get this absolute continuity between everything they do. And Again, chicken or the egg, they have this phenomenal culture. Whether the culture drove the product and the success or the success drove the culture, again, hard to know, but the two are um, intertwined. And what they, what they have, they don't seem to have salespeople in, in Apple. They seem to have these advocates, these people who absolutely believe in the product. Um, they're enthusiasts, and you kind of get, get caught up in that particular passion and rather than actually being sold products. So there's four key components to the emotional value proposition. The first one is being clear about what specific customer you're targeting. Second one is about which emotional need that you're going to fulfill and you're going to answer. The third part is about what specific price positioning. And the very last bit is about what distinctive personality will you, um, will you express. So I'll take a look at the first two um, and uh, look at what about the, choosing a specific customer and um, look at the emotional needs. And to use, a, use an example, um, this one's about armpits. So if you think about it, we all have them. And um, boys, girls, young, old, rich, poor, we all have armpits. And unfortunately, we have sweaty armpits. Um, and we all need deodorant, although not everyone sadly subscribes to that. But most of us use, um, use deodorant. Now, if you try to, <laughs> he's not shaking his head. That's why he got seats clear around you. <laughs> um, so if you think about, 
if you're trying to market to all of these audiences, uh, teenagers, boys, girls, rich, poor, old, young, and you were trying to find what is that one driving emotional need? What is that consumer purchasing behavior? It'd be virtually impossible. It's just too broad. Unless you had millions and millions and millions of dollars to do just a blanket advertising campaign, you would absolutely struggle. But if you were to pick, let's just say, one very thin slice, which is teenage boys, and you were to say, okay, now what's the number one emotional need of a teenage boy? Anyone want to shout that out? Anyone got teenage? Who said that? Sex, was that? Yes, you're absolutely, um, absolutely bang on. Um, and that was the, the proposition that, that in, in simplicity that Lynx based its um, brand on. And if you think about deodorant, is a massive, complex, um, very competitive environment. Lynx hit the marketplace with this one offer to this one audience. Um, and now it occupies 20% of the uh, global market in, in deodorant, which is, which is phenomenal. Um, now, what you find is when you absolutely bullseye and pinpoint one market segment, it becomes intuitive almost. You don't need millions of dollars worth of market research. It's kind of intuitive. You go, well, now I know what that number one emotional need is that I need to fulfill. Also, you can pretty much guess um, without a hell of a lot of data how you're going to talk to them, what magazines they read, where they go for information, what tone of voice. It actually becomes really easy, um, which when you're an SME and you have limited budget, you really want to be able to be focused and, and make it easy. So um, pinpointing that specific market, understanding that emotional need are two critical parts. Um, moving on to price positioning. Uh, very important because uh, at the end of the day, we're all in business to make money, except for not for profits, I suppose. Um, and in simple terms, uh, I flew all the way over to um, Boston to learn this very simple fact, which is quite scary, that um, the only way really to make money is to create a gap or a wedge between a customer's willingness to pay and the cost incurred to create that service, okay? That's your profitability, simple as that. Um, now, the clever people at Harvard discovered that there are only two pricing strategies. It's always nice to know that you know, there's only very simple things. Um, two pricing strategies. The first one is what they've called um, successful differentiated strategy. So it's about fundamentally driving up this willingness to pay, using all the marketing and all the activity to make people pay a lot for it. Again, like um, iPhones are about double the price of some other, some other phones. Uh, and making their biggest wedge between what it costs you to deliver that, that product. And that's what makes um, profitability. I mean, obviously, the, higher the, higher the, the bigger the wedge, the bigger the gap, the, the more um, profitability. Uh, and brands <laughs> keep looking at this computer, which is a completely different screen. This is my one. Um, so Apple is a great example. Whole Foods, Nespresso. Has anyone got an Nespresso machine? God, I swear by that thing. That's fantastic. Um, Harley. Um, a great example is Cirque du Soleil. I mean, fundamentally, the, a ticket to this circus is about uh, 10 times what the average circus and uh, charges. So that's a massive premium, and these are a very profitable business. Now, the second strategy is uh, low cost or discount, whereby you try and keep the, um, where the willingness to pay is either low or you keep it low and become the cheaper in the marketplace. And what you do is you drive down your, your costs in order to make that, get that wedge and make that profitability. Sounds pretty logical and pretty obvious, but where it gets complex, and every time I show this next slide, a lot of people go, oh, that's the epiphany. Um, oh, sorry, so some examples are Walmart. Um, if anyone's flown Aer Lingus in, in the UK, you, you'll know exactly the masters of um, low cost. Uh, so disaster is when you try and do both, where for whatever reason, you often it's about pride or a belief that your product has to be the best, you invest and you invest to get the best product, but you either fail to drive up willingness to pay or you succumb to um, uh, pricing, um, pricing wars or discounting wars. And so what you end up with is, this, if you're lucky, that very thin slice of profitability. And this is probably one of the main reasons why a lot of businesses go broke. They try and do both. With pricing, you have to choose one of the two. You can't do both. Um, it's good there's only two, so you can either flip a coin if you wanted to, but you have to do both. And once you do that, it becomes, everything else becomes um, a lot more clear. Uh, da, 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 ripping through. So the last um, component of the value proposition is a distinctive personality. Uh, let your personality shine is very important and it's what the successful businesses do. Um, and this is really, really important. See, what, what tends to happen in business? Actually, I'll, I'll go back. Um, this is important because fundamentally in our daily lives, we're all social beings. I mean, we're, we're hardwired to use personality to help us navigate 
uh, all the people that we come into contact with. And it helps us, personality helps us um, decide who we're going to form these relationships with and these bonds. Um, personality is such a critical um, driver. Yet, interestingly enough, when we start talking business, we kind of forget this. And if you've noticed, um, people then start to talk about uh, facts and figures and all the rational things, and they forget about the importance of personality as one of the key, um, the key drivers. So, and this is, again, back to Apple, so many reasons why they're a phenomenally successful business. They absolutely capitalise on this phenomenon, which is about all of their competitors, particularly in, this, um, in their space, were all talking about gigabytes and terabytes and processing speed and all those really rational, functional things. And Apple went in and go, <laughs> crazy, no one's um, communicating on, on personality and behavioural grounds. And so they came in with this uh, young, effortlessly cool guy, and it became very clear where, and it's very clever where, on the left was rational, boring PC, and on the right was the cool guy, the guy that sits up the back of the bus. So millions of people around the world, which one do you think they wanted to form a relationship with? It, it became absolutely clear. Um, and Virgin, again, I... Uh, being a very pro cool Australian, when Virgin hit the market, I thought, there is no way this company is going to be successful. There's no way. I'll never fly them. Um, but what they understood, a couple of things they understood was uh, a very Australian philosophy is giving the underdog a go, which they, they were all about, keeping the airfare. Second thing is, in a very boring, a very, um, where Qantas was very, very boring and very pragmatic, they came in with a whole lot of irreverent fun. Um, remember the boarding calls? When I very first heard the boarding call, when I landed in Sydney, they said, now, welcome to Adelaide. <laughs> what? Um, and just the, the humour, even down the um, next slide, just down, oh, it's very hard to see on this screen. My screen, it looks great. Let me read it. Um, so carousel rides, baggage only, um, I'm hot stuff. The one in the middle is laptops must be removed from carry bags, in brackets, bikini tops are fine. Um, and on the very right, the one that I don't think you can see says, all the emotional baggage you want, as long as it fits in here. So they took the very boring, rational stuff and made it fun and personality. And hey, I know the one that I prefer to fly with now. So... That gives the background to the uh, emotional value proposition. And um, let's look at the second part around uh, effective communication. So I guess the first, again, logical principle here is uh, nobody apart from these two guys buy invisible products. Uh, but sadly, many, many businesses are completely invisible to their consumers. They're not even on the radar. Uh, and you could, again, have the best product in the world with all the best attributes. You could have put your life savings into it. But if no one, or particularly your consumers, don't know about it, they're never going to buy it and, you, and you know, you're never going to be a success. So, you know, being on the radar is, is a critical part and it's one of the f um, foundations of the communication part. If, uh, hopefully you can read that, yep. So, if you think about the, um, what we call the customer relationship model, there's five key steps that we all go through. Now, this relationship can depending on product or category, be six-month journey or can be um, you know, an impulse purchase, a, a three-minute exercise, but we still go through this process. Step one, they need to be, or as consumers, we need to be aware of your product. I need to know about you before I'm going to buy you. Uh, the second thing is I need to know you and I need to like you. I'm not going to buy a product that I don't like. No one does. But I need to know you first, like you, before I'm going to even think about buying your product. Then, if I like, if, if those two things are, boxes are ticked, then I'll actually give it a go. I'll, I'll try it. And if I like that, then you'll get my commitment to your business. And if I continue to like that, um, you'll build my loyalty. And so that's literally the five steps that you have to go through. So if you think of the communication process, in a lot of businesses, when we first start to talk about uh, marketing communication, the first question we ask is, of all of your consumers, all the people who could potentially buy your product, what percentage do you think actually know you exist? And it's amazing how many say, oh, God, you know what? We've got about 20 clients. Oh, that's about 0.001%. It's like, okay, so perhaps the very first thing we need to work on is how do we get awareness? Because until we get awareness, we're not going to get people moving through the next five steps of the um, buying um, model. Uh, now, the other thing is, I'll say years ago, which is pre-GFC, uh, this used to be the domain of um, the big companies with the big marketing teams and the very big budgets. Uh, They'd have to run a TV ad that just blasts to everybody. And if that didn't work, they'd throw more money at it and blast it to more. And if that didn't work, then they might do more magazine. Um, big budgets is the only way it seemed to work, which was completely out of reach for the, the SME or the startups. Um, the very good news is, through, I guess, technology, social media, um, and all the electronic communication, the world has changed. The way we, the way we view and um, 
take on. Communication has changed forever. And the great news is for small businesses is a lot of it is incredibly low cost. A lot of it is incredibly trackable. Remember that, I don't know if you heard that quote about um, only half my advertising works, I don't know which half. Uh, the good thing about electronic communications is you can measure who opened it, who looked at it, who didn't, how long they looked at it, what were they interested in. I mean, you could never do that with mass market television. So again, the good news is this has created a level playing field. So now SMEs can compete with the big businesses probably more effectively. I mean, one of the things, again, that's come out of the GFC, um, an analogy is a bushfire. So whilst the bushfire is can be absolutely devastating, but what happens straight after bushfires, all these little buds of new life come up. Um, that's what will happen now is a lot of the small businesses will be dynamic. The, the whole landscape of communication has changed and businesses that start up now will actually be attuned to this new um, uh, environment as opposed to big businesses will struggle to, to turn themselves around. Um, in fact, I think it was a 60% of the Forbes top 500 businesses actually started up in the last recession. So if you're a startup or an SME, now's your time to shine. Um, if, I'm not going to have time to go through this in a lot of detail, but as a great example of how incredibly low-cost social media can turn you from literally a, a startup to a multi-billion dollar business in a very short space of time, um, Google Lauren Luke, not now, not now at the end. Um, so Lauren Luke was uh, a struggling single mum, I think she's in um, Dublin, and to make, make a bit of extra money to make, help make ends meet, she started selling cosmetics by doing little demonstrations on YouTube from her webcam in her, in her bedroom. Um, not that type of web, you know, was, she was clothed, as you can see there, was all very above board. Um, and what happened very, very quickly is she got an enormously large following. Now, this is an older one, but there's 312,000 people have looked at this particular one. Here, I just grabbed this randomly out of, because um, there's, according to that, there's 375 of them that she's, she's got. Um, and she was just doing her thing, and she got this bigger, bigger following, and a global following. Again, electronic comms, we now have we're competing with a global market, but we also have access to a global market without being a multinational um, business. Um, anyway, what happened was uh, Sephora, I don't know Sephora, the big cosmetic chain in the States, all of a sudden looked at, she, she came up in um, conversation, they looked at it and they noticed that she had a bigger following than their whole um, American database. So they, needless to say, long story short, they went over and um, chatted to her. Now, now she actually is the key person in a multi, multi, multi million dollar rum cosmetics brand. And that was in the space of about two years from startup to, uh, to growth. So that's the good news. Makes me sound like I was about to say there's bad news. No, there's no more bad news. Uh, so there's two components to a really effective communication, um, uh, effective communication campaign. The first part is around um, reach, making sure that you're reaching the right audience. And we've spoken about the, the importance of defining that audience. Um, with the right message, and again, we know now the emotional driver of our audience, so we know what the right message is. Um, using the right channels, and um, we've seen, uh, and I, I won't step on the toes of uh, the woman who's following me later, Rebecca, um, in terms of social media, but, but once we know our customers incredibly well, it becomes quite intuitive and obvious what magazines they read, what, what television shows, how, they, um, how to reach them. Um, and importantly, frequency. Communicate with them as frequently as possible, but without stalking. Stalking's not good, but communicate with them as frequently as you can. So, now, in terms of how do you get this data to know exactly what, what media, because obviously that previous slide with the kind of complex thing said, oh my God, there's so many choices, and many businesses can't afford to uh, use all those channels. So how do you decide which are the most important ones, which are the ones to channel your um, budget into? Uh, there's a couple of ways, three, three ways uh, in particular, ranging from the more expensive down to the, down to the cheaper. Um, the first one is you can buy data. I mean, Big Brother is out there and Big Brother is alive and well. The, the data you can get on us is phenomenal. Um, we worked with Coles and the data on consumption is, is um, incredible. Uh, so this is an example of uh, some data we got from Roy Morgan. So you can get Roy Morgan, Nielsen. You can also get some industry reports which... Um, yeah, I think you can download for free if you're part of a, a book, a group, group I should say. Um, so here's an example of, uh, we were looking at the uh, women 18 plus, and what we discovered, if you can see the little red line, that shows the, the media they consume um, more frequently than any other, any other group. So in this particular situation, huge consumers of cinema, a um, little bit more in catalogue, a little bit more in pay TV, definitely well below everyone else on internet and, um, and uh, newspaper. 
and definitely below everybody else on TV, uh, and outdoor was really important. So interestingly enough, with this client pre-doing that, they were spending uh, $100,000 in, uh, where was it? In uh, newspaper. Go, it's not, why, you're, you're there where your customers aren't reading and aren't watching. So by actually looking at this, we were able to channel all of their money into the one or two key areas where their customers um, indexed higher on, and it was um, significantly more effective for their budget. Um, and also just the data you can get on magazine in terms of the, uh, you know, 375,000 of our particular target market read Marie Claire as opposed to only 34,000 read Modern Wedding. Now again, they were putting ads into uh, Modern Wedding. It's like, well, you, you're playing in a space, sure, it's significantly cheaper, I think. Um, you're playing in a space where uh, less of your consumers are actually reading. So let's put it into the place where they're actually, um, where they really are. Uh, the other area is, again, once you know who they are, ask them. You know, grab a little group of them together and say, okay, when, what, what magazines do you read? Where do you go for information? Do you talk to your friends? Do you jump online? How do you go about um, finding information? Um, and down to the, very, the third one being the, the most inexpensive, is, it's intuitive. I mean, again, back to Lynx. I'm sure the, the uh, marketing team at Lynx could have said, well, I know that the uh, teenage boy will jump on internet, talk to friends, probably read Ralph magazine, uh, and I bet you they would have spent a huge amount of money to find exactly that. So when you know your customer, you can actually be, be quite intuitive about uh, where they are going for information. In terms of um, channels, I mean, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Again, as you, you can gather, the uh, direction around what media consume is based on your specific business's customer. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all. But one, one of the great rule of thumbs is that, rules of thumb, is uh, the more channels that you use, the merrier, the much more effective it's going to be. Uh, a great example, you may uh, remember, and it was an incredibly clever campaign, in a, in a category that's, there's a lot of cynicism from, from um, us consumers, and uh, it's incredibly competitive amongst, and undifferentiated amongst the top four. NAB developed this strategy about separating themselves from everybody else, not being tarnished with that um, same brush, and so they developed the uh, We're Breaking Up With Other Banks campaign. Uh, and incredibly cleverly, they launched this on Valentine's Day 2011, or last year. Um, and in, they used, and they've won so many awards for integrated communication for social media, uh, based on um, you know performance and uh, and uh, results. <clears throat> so within their campaign, they used traditional media because they're a big profitable bank. They had they had the money. They they did traditional television. Um, they did some traditional magazine. But what they did is they used a lot of non-traditional media. They um, just uh, top middle. There's a, there was a little truck driving around the city with a guy on the back playing the piano and singing. I forgot what song it was, but he was singing this kind of breakup song to the other banks. Uh, they even hired actors, and on Valentine's Day night, um, they had actors posing as um, bank managers from different banks that were all in different restaurants around Australia, and they staged a very visual, a very vocal breakup. And that was people were just imagine seeing the restaurant going, "What the hell? These two bank managers broke up." Um, even down to hiring actors that they taped up to uh, lamp poles, and um, down to the very basic cheap stuff. I mean, chalk, you know, chalk painting on the footpath outside all the competitive banks. Uh, so they used all of the channels, they used all of the bits, and it's a bit of the one plus one equals three when the um, you know net results greater than the sum of its parts. But the you know the results, and particularly in an, in an incredibly competitive and completely undifferentiated marketplace, the results were phenomenal. I mean, 79% increase in home loan inquiries. I mean, could you imagine? I don't know what that translates to because I couldn't find that information. But imagine what that is in terms of dollars. 50% increase in credit card applications. 50%. 20% increase in new accounts. Um, and in the first three days, they became the number one trending topic on Twitter, uh, and they had 100,000 plus visits to their breakup blog. So all the social media, all the bits created this one incredibly effective um, campaign. Uh, just bring on home with the last two bits of advice. Um, keeping it fresh. As, as consumers, uh, we get bored very easily. So you can't keep sending the same message over and over and over again um, because it gets very boring. And we filter it out and we switch off. So what you need to do is find what we call new news. What are reasons to actually, you know, create a song and dance, jump up and down, shout from the from the rooftops? Um, and launching new products is always, you know, a great example. If you look at again, Virgin, Richard Branson, love him or hate him, but he would never miss an opportunity to create a massive song and dance when launching a new product. And again, back to Apple. These are some stats I dug up in terms of the performance figures of Apple over the past 25 years. I mean, what this tells me 
is that if Apple didn't continue to develop and hit the market with new products, they may not be around today. I mean, Mac dropped off quite significantly, and was a, so that would indicate they were you know, hitting, um, hitting you know, to a, not a good place. Uh, then came iPod and iPhone, which launched them right up to a phenomenally successful business, but then that dropped off. Had they not picked up and launched iPad, where would they be now? challenge for them is, and as they know, they, they um, commit a phenomenal amount of money into uh, new product development. They always understand they've got to hit the market with new products because it keeps people excited and always, um, always interested in wanting to find out more. Speaking of excited. Uh, and the last bit of advice is you have to be excited. You and your staff have to be excited by your product and your service. Uh, you've got to find ways to, to, to get excited because if you're not excited, how do you expect your customers to be excited? And again, if you Think about um, Apple, they, they go to enormous lengths to um, create this excitement within their staff. I mean, the shot, I'm pointing to there, the shot at the top, which is a little bit dark, looks like the lights are off on there, uh, was Steve Jobs doing a Skype link up to all of the stores just before they're about to open the doors on the very first day of launching the, um, the iPhone. He was getting the staff pumped up and excited, and if you can see down, down the bottom, that, that became incredibly infectious. Uh, the staff got excited, then the customers got excited. And um, I mean, who wouldn't want to get their, their clients to, or customers to walk out of their business with even 5% of this excitement? I mean, does anyone, has anyone had clients walk out with, <laughs> with that? It would be great, so just to get a small percentage. Um, and you do these things and the results absolutely speak for yourself as um, is shown here by uh, Joe's reaction. So that's ooh, just about the time I've got because I think we'll allow some time for, for questions. So if I was to leave you with three really important thoughts, um, important to me, hopefully important to you. Uh, so the first one is, again, don't fall into the trap of trying to be all things to all people. I know times are tough and that's the tendency is to do that, but it's a bit of a leap of faith. Focus on the reverse. Do less things to less people. Um, in fact, the guys at Harvard Business School were saying, if you're not disappointing people, you don't have a strategy. So it's a good thing. Um, make sure that you develop that emotional value proposition. Make sure it's emotionally driven. Make sure it's single-minded and it's focused on a very specific market segment. Second part is, second thought is, now once you've got that proposition, make sure you communicate this in absolutely everything that you do. Right across your product, every touch point, every time a consumer comes into um, contact with your business, make sure that you communicate that one thought across everything. Um, and make sure you use as many channels that you can manage and as many channels that, that your business can afford. And again, great news that there's so many more channels now that are, that are effective, measurable, and incredibly low cost. Um, and the last thought, yes, yeah, just get excited. Find ways to, to get excited, get your team excited, your staff excited. Um, and because life's too short, you've got to enjoy what you do. So that's it for me. Hopefully that's, um, there's been a few things there that you'll be able to take back to your businesses and help. So I think we're going to throw to the floor for any um, questions. Any questions? Mm. Any, um, you know, I'm gonna, any takers? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe a couple of comments rather than questions, but I'd like your thoughts on them. Um, I've always been intrigued by a Coke strategy because no one actually knows what Coke costs. That's right. Yeah. You go to the supermarket, it's a different price in a bottle shop, it's a different price in post mix, it's a different price uh, if it's on special or in a garage, you know, service station. So, They've never even talked about price and concentrated wholly and solely the emotional um, the emotional side that folks are able to attend to. So it's carefully avoided all of that and they can charge whatever they like because the intensity to pay is obviously whatever they want to pay at the time. And it's based on need. So I've got a comment on that, but I'll go to the next couple of things. Um, I have a bit of an aversion to their way. I don't see them as quite as innovative or as fresh or friendly or as um, doing wacky things anymore, and they've actually turned out to be just another airline, although I still like them. So I'm wondering, watch this space, yeah. Yeah, yeah. wondering why they've gone there to that level and whether they'll come back. And the other one is uh, NAB, which I thought they did the right thing in the initial stages with the strategy, but the latest round of rate rises where they were hanging off, hanging off, they kind of look like they've become another bank again. And I guess they've got to have the wherewithal to stick with it because um, three great points. If I could just um, comment on the first one. I mean, great point. <clears throat> in, 
it's very easy to get caught up in the whole discounting war, and no one wins that one, believe me, no one, no one wins, apart from consumers, actually. Uh, when you have all the other boxes ticked, price becomes less of an option. It just becomes less of a rate. I mean, I don't know what, what Coke costs, but if I, well, not a Coke drinker, but if I was to drink Coke, it's just there, and if that's $2 or $5, that's not the number one driver of why I'll buy it over Pepsi. It's it's everything else. Um, the second one with Virgin, yeah, they've they've fallen into the big trap of uh, changing what they built the brand on in the first place. And when you change your way, that builds distrust. And um, yeah, I'm um, interested to see how they how they go. Um, and the third point, I'm trying to remember. The, um, now, yeah, they uh, that was the other good point is that discipline. One of the critical things, it's, it's not come up with a magical solution. There's no silver bullet, but discipline is absolutely incredible, um, incredibly important there. There was a study done a few years ago of the, I think it was the world's most, 50 most successful businesses, and it was a big McKinsey report trying to find that one thing. And almost to their disappointment, after thousands of interviews and enormous amount of data, they discovered that the only thing those successful businesses had in common is that they did all the basics to an exceptionally high standard. It just says that um, discipline, do the basics, commit to them um, with diligence and, you know, relentlessness, that's, that's what creates success. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for those um, points. Yes? So, the importance of um, hand for an existing product, is that Look, I'm not sure specifically of what that would be, and I'm, <clears throat> I guess it would be different for different businesses. I'm, I'm sure what Apple did was watch the cycle of product, and when it starts to dip, they'd be, they'd be um, getting into the product, product innovation like crazy to then launch the new one. They'd watch that, they'd see when it started to drop off, and they'd be working like crazy for the next innovation. So I guess, now, other businesses, that might be a 10-year cycle. Some businesses, that might be, like in uh, fad products, they'd have to be developing new products every 12 months. Apple, that was, uh, from memory, about five-year cycles? Or? So different for different businesses, and the mix, you just got to look at the numbers and react. I mean, that's why smaller businesses will have the advantage over bigger businesses. You've got to be nimble, you've got to change, you've got to react quickly, and, and um, I guess that would be the... But does that get down to also <clears throat> that loyalty today is no longer as big as what it used to be? Um, there as well? In, in some... Even though you're trying to create loyalty and things, but... There's still loyalty. The difference is we now have many, many, many more options than we've ever had before. We now, through, through the internet, um, we now have a world of, a world of um, businesses that we can choose to spend our money with. We're not limited just by the ones in our local shopping centre or e even in the, in the state. So I guess by having more options has probably created more choice, which has created more of a commodity out of most businesses. But <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bit of an Apple loyalist, and I've always had Apple since my very first um, computer, and I, I wouldn't dream of buying anything else. It also means that, yeah, you've got to keep being fresh <coughs> and trading those new ideas oh, yeah. because of that. Because if Apple hadn't have launched anything new, I, I still wouldn't have the little Mac Plus. <laughs> I would sit there and go, this is great, <laughs> while I waited for five hours for it to process the, uh, the, the first percent. email. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, any other questions? Must be one more, yes. Um, I'm, I'm interested just to get your take on the, the marketing promise that a company might put out there. Um, I've often experienced that some companies don't back that up by having the operational support to back up their marketing promise. Um, so I think the business that potentially is quite a trap. Yeah. <clears throat> I wonder if someone was going to raise that. Yeah, it's, the, the point I was making here is about a lot of business will focus just on the product and getting the product perfect, and the product's not going to actually make the difference. You have to be a great marketer of that product. But really good point to raise is that you can't create a promise and then not deliver on the promise, because what happens if, again, back in you know life, daily life, if someone makes you a promise and doesn't deliver, you don't trust them anymore. It's exactly the same with businesses and, and brands. Um, if <clears throat> you don't deliver on your promise, then you know, you'll only be around for a short period of time. So yes, it is, it is important. Um, but again, don't fall into the trap of uh, trying to make it absolutely perfect before you even get to market because you won't make any money and you won't, won't be around. I think it was the, was it the uh, Microsoft principle that if they waited for a software to be perfect, they never ever would have launched software. Just set a deadline, get it the best you can by that deadline, and then launch it. Then work on the next one. I think I'll try and subscribe because I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I tend to try and wait for it perfect. So Microsoft principle, Microsoft principle. So any other, um, any other questions? Must be one more, come on, one more. All good? 
Um, if you want, I think on the next slide, I've got my email address there. Flick me an email if you want a copy of the, of the notes. Um, let me know and I can um, email them through. And again, I'm um, here for a while, so if you want to have a, have a chat, by all means, um, grab me. I look forward to talking to you. So again, thank you very much for asking me to, to speak, and I hope you um, all got something out of it. True. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Grant Davidson. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. As, uh, as Grant mentioned there, he's going to be hanging around for a while, so uh, if you've got some individual questions that you may want to ask specifically about your own business, please uh, come and ask Grant.